Okay. Okay. It has been insane. We have Crushing this training, so calm in this new environment. Yeah. I think it's nice. Hi, Lena. <laughs> Hello. Okay, great. Uh, thanks for your patience. We're going to get started. Um, okay, so welcome to Flu Call. Uh, for Fundamentals for Startups Fridays. Uh, we are part of Commotion Labs. If you've never been to Fluke Hall, we specialize in life science and biotech companies. Uh, in Commotion Labs has two other incubator spaces. Uh, we have Commotion HQ, and they specialize in AR, VR, and emerging tech. We also have Startup Hall, which is in software, IT, FinTech, uh, and they're managed by Ashley, who's in the back, guiding new people in. <laughs> Uh, and we also have a makerspace downstairs, managed by Chu, back there, also in black. It's a matching thing today. Um, not planned. Um, but yes, welcome. Um, just a few announcements. 
Uh, next week's fundamental speaker will be Andy Albertson, a partner of Fenwick and West, and he will discuss how to negotiate with investors. Um, just as a reminder, if you're interested in one of our speakers or topics but are unable to make it, we actually live stream all of our uh, talks on our YouTube page. Uh, and you can also watch older um, speaker series over there too. So, and there's a fundamentals for startups playlist on our YouTube page. Um, we also have a social happy hour event this coming Tuesday, uh, on March 5th, uh, Taco Tuesday, sponsored by UPS, will be here in the ID Lab, a flu call. Um, everyone in the community is welcome to attend that one. That is to meet everyone in this space. If you're interested in Commotion Labs, Flu Call, or just startups in general. Uh, if you want to see other events and more information, you can actually visit our Commotion um, events page. Uh, it's commotion.udub.edu backward slash events. Um, uh, let me introduce today's speaker, Shauna Casey, who will be talking about the startup studio model, building a startup in six months. Shauna Casey is a longtime Seattle marketing veteran, recently joined Madrona Venture Labs as a partner at the startup studio backed by Madrona Venture Group. She previously worked at Galvanize, Decide.com, Nordstrom, Every Move, Google, Comcast, Startup Weekend, and the Seattle Mariners. Casey will, was most recently at Portland, Oregon based banking startup Simple Finance, helping the banking startup open the Seattle office. Uh, without further ado, Shana. We can have a good discussion during Q&A as well. Um, so that was, thank you for the intro. Uh, my first job was actually working for the Seattle Mariners. I was the ball girl starting when I was 14 years old. I had to try out for the job. It was high stress. One girl broke her finger. So it was, it was like when you mentioned Seattle Mariners, I, brings back some fun memories, because usually people don't mention that. It was so long ago now. Um, so I'm Shauna Kazi. Um, if you want to contact me, I've got my Twitter up here, which is actually a better way to reach me than email. So if anybody has any follow-up, feel free to send me a note on Twitter after this or during the presentation. Um, how many people in the room are actively working on a startup right now? So maybe 80%. OK, I'm really curious what the rest of you are doing, thinking about working on a startup, right? Um, is, is anybody willing to share, maybe we'll get one person, would you be willing to share uh, the name of your startup in your one sentence overview? Anyone? I think there are some people over here. Oh yeah, go for it. Uh, and I'll repeat it because we're being li or live streaming. The company is called Tidy Hut and we're developing a non-disgusting portable toilet. Yes, so I've heard of you. Tidy Hut, uh, non-disgusting portable toilet, which is fascinating. Bill Gates is really into toilets right now. Yeah. and. Uh, I think I read something like the toilet hasn't been innovated in 100 years. 90 years? Yeah. 90 years, yeah. Yeah. Um, very cool. Okay, so that was great. I love that you have a one sentence overview of your startup. So, all right, about, sounds like about 80% of you are working on startups. The rest of you are interested in some way in startups. Um, I'm going to go over a few things. I'm probably not going to cover everything, but we can um, have a good QA session on anything I don't cover. Um, so, the first thing I wanted to everybody can see that, I wanted to cover is um, just this right here. So you've all seen this, right? Probably. Have, has, has anyone not seen this before? Okay, I think everyone's seen it. Um, so it's got the, this, this PR, you know, you, you have a lot of success in the beginning, you've got a lot of excitement, and then you go down and you're in this long sort of what they call the trough of sorrow. <laughs> and I think I wanted to just start out with this because it is so true. You know, we've seen this before. We've talked about it, and I feel like it's so true. Startups are really hard. They are really hard. There's founder dynamics. Founders sometimes split up. There's equity discussions that sometimes are d difficult. And it sounds like you're going to hear a little bit more um, next week about talking with VCs. I mean, that's stressful. You have to sell your idea and make it sound as good as you possibly can without saying anything that's incorrect and <laughs> falsifying data. Um, but it is, it's, it's, really, it's really difficult. And so the interesting thing about the lab is we're kind of on this model. This is how we live in an ongoing basis on multiple uh, ideas at the exact same time. And then we've got this going on. So this is the, this side is emotion and time, right? And then we've got this one. There's, there's a whole bunch of these, but I thought these three were kind of funny. This one is your social life, basically the green, the green, uh, <laughs> 
<laughs> the green line's going straight down. Anxiety's going up. Um, imposter syndrome. You know, there's, there's a lot of research that entrepreneurs have depression at different times. There's just, you're feeling alone. There's a lot going on. So for me personally, I'm actually pregnant too. So I'm five months pregnant, by the way. So on top of all that, I decided I'm going to have two babies in three years. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so I just thought, like, I, you know, I'm in the middle of this, like, on a daily basis, and sometimes it just helps me to stop and remember that startups are actually really hard, and this is part of the process. Like, it's not, you know, it's never the end of the world. You're going to figure out things and get through it, but you go through these times where it feels like um, either giving up or giving up on the startup world itself because it's just a roller coaster. It's a total roller coaster. So. With that, um, I'll jump in to uh, a little bit about uh, Madrona Venture Labs. Have you all heard of Madrona, Madrona Venture Labs? A few of you? Okay. So Madrona Venture Group is one of the top VC firms here in Seattle. They were an early investor in Amazon. And a few years ago, they started a studio within Madrona Venture Group. Now we're actually separate from Madrona Venture Group. We're still part of we're, we're connected to it, but we're actually on our own floor, and we have our um, we have a co-working space called Crate 33. Uh, it's down t downtown Seattle in the Wells Fargo building, and um, really our mission is to create exceptional companies by uniting proven ideas with heroic founders. So there's kind of a lot to that. This is actually the team, and I'll go over the team in just a minute. But really, what we do is we start ideas from scratch, from the very beginning. We think up ideas. <laughs> there's kind of a lot of pressure on thinking up an idea, what are we thinking up, how are we doing it, validating it within six to nine months, and then bringing people in to run the idea and spin it out. So we're trying to like basically accelerate the entire process, get some really good signals that we know that the startup's worth investing in. We'll often ask Madrona Venture Group to invest in it, they're just upstairs, um, and then spin it out. So it's like, acceleration, it's like an acceleration to probably what some of you are on, on a regular basis, and we're trying to kind of perfect this model, and, and we're still working on it. So this is the team. Um, we're a fairly small team. Uh, in the middle, Jay is our CTO. Some of you might know Kira because she used to be here at CoMotion. Um, and then we've got a mix of engineers, uh, designers, um, just diff sort of different, all different types of people that you would generally have at a startup. So we kind of consider ourselves our own little startup at the lab. Um, some of the companies that um, we've all been at, we've been at a whole bunch of different companies. Um, two of us uh, were working, three of us were working on Decide.com, which pred predicted the future price of really any product on Amazon up to two weeks in the future, so you knew if you should buy or wait. Um, Faircast is similar with um, flights. So Rover, obviously a lot of you know Rover started at Startup Weekend. That was a Madrona Venture, la uh, Madrona Venture Group company. Um, that was, had ties to the lab as well. So there's a lot of, um, we've already got some case studies in the last few years with the lab. Um, and it's been fun to kind of see some of them now that are a few years old and have traction and are getting their second round of funding. And then um, going into a little bit of sort of what our, what our North Star is. Our North Star is founders because we want to create successful companies and to do that we're really focused on founders. So. Um, that's almost like our sole focus is looking at talent and how can we develop talent in this ecosystem and how can we really leverage everything that we have in Seattle and all the different areas that we're good at. Um, here are a couple companies. This one actually turned into Message Yes and sold to Nordstrom. That was one of our um, earlier lab companies. And here's some. This domicile is still going. They are um, helping... Uh, business travelers, it's sort of like an Airbnb product for business travelers. That one's doing well. And then I thought um, it's important to just kind of talk a little bit about what the startup model is and what the trade-offs are before we jump into the rest of the startup model. So um, does anyone in the room just want to bootstrap your company? Yeah, I feel you, I feel you. There's a lot of good reasons to do that. Does anyone want to go for v in, uh, VC funding? Well, three people in the room, that's it, Wh what? Three people in the room are going, going for VC funding? I'm very curious, what the re what are, are the rest of you just thinking about it? Okay, oh, okay, okay, four, okay, we've got four, all right. So a few people, and I think there's others that probably aren't raising their hand. Um, and I know this might be a little bit hard to see, but basically um, this says founder risk and founder equity increases at the top, right? So we've got bootstrapping a company, 
Um, you'd keep equity in full control, really, um, unless you have co-founders or you create a board or different investors that have, uh, or, or different um, board members that might have some equity. Um, and that's generally, the cons of that are generally that you're gonna grow slower. And maybe that's okay if your business doesn't need to grow fast. Um, you're probably gonna do some moonlighting, so you're probably gonna do it while you have a full-time job. You know, a lot of people do that. Um, little or no salary, and really the hardest thing I think is the lack of support. You kind of have to go out of your way to get people to pay attention to you and get people to do coffee meetings and just, you know, it's, it's a little bit more hustle or a lot more hustle. And then you've got this middle tier, which is the accelerator. Um, Techstars, YC, we have an accelerator at Madrona Venture Group that I'm actually um, leading. Um, that's how I know of Tidy, Tidy Huts. Tidy Hut, Tidy Hut. Tidy Hut. Um, but I've, I've, I've looked at your application quite a few times, so. Um, so I, it's, it's neat to see all the different um, startups in Seattle. And the thing with the accelerator is, so you have majority ownership, you have this mentor network, you can work on it full time because usually you have money from, or at least maybe a three month runway, hopefully more, um, from the accelerator company. But you do have this limited window, which is a huge con because you've got three months to prove it out. So if you feel like your idea just needs three months, then you can have a big milestone moment where you can get, um, and that's usually on track to institutional funding. So usually you want to get around after you go through an accelerator program at the end of that program, which is generally about three months. There's some that are longer. And then you've got this, well, you have a salary trade-off. Obviously, you're taking a bit of a risk. You're probably quitting your job to do the accelerator, which is what most people do. They probably work up until they start the accelerator. Um, so that's kind of the middle tier. And then down here, you've got the start startup studio, which um, Madrona Labs, Betaworks, many of you are probably familiar with PSL, which is another startup studio in town um, with a lot of ties to Madrona as well. Um, so with this one, the, the pros are really that you've got this validation um, traction to real company uh, on ramp. So you're gonna figure out really fast with a lot of support if this idea is gonna work or not. Um, You've got VC funding support, most likely, or, or a lot of ties to figure that out. So you should have VC funding, experienced advisors, um, and then you're sharing the founder equity, equity with the lab. So um, the equity is lower, but you are on sort of this advanced path to get there faster and with a lot of support. So that's really um, kind of the three, the three models. We can talk more about this if anyone has questions in the Q&A too, because I know I, I'm going over that fairly fast. Okay, so focus areas. This, is a, this has been a big one for us over the last few months. Um, and we really see ourselves at the studio kind of in between entrepreneurs and investors. So we, we are a form of an investor. We're, so for instance, when we're looking at accelerator companies or when we're starting a company, we're looking to make, we have a really high bar and if that company is a big, a big enough market, um, we're actually looking at ideas that are billion dollar ideas is what we hope. We, ne we need some billion dollar ideas to make the lab format work. Um, but then we're also in between sort of being an entrepreneur because we are the ones starting the idea in the early stages before we bring someone in to actually lead the idea, we're the ones leading the idea. Um, so we need to be able to see the opportunities and then figure out kind of from an investor standpoint, have that kind of critical eye on if it's gonna work or not. So have you all um, had a friend who started a startup who just worked on it way too long. <laughs> I feel like this is the most common part where they'll go, I've got an idea, I'm gonna make um, Instagram shoppable <laughs> or some, something like this, or I'm gonna create uh, Instagram for dogs, um, just as a crazy example. And then they work on it for like three years and after year one or maybe even after a few months you could have seen they weren't really getting any traction, they don't have enough customers, you know, it doesn't se seem like things are really going but they just keep working on it. So we're, we're really trying to have that eye of like, if we don't have traction, then we need to either pivot or kill the idea really fast. We're not gonna waste resources. It's mostly resources, our time that we would be spending on another idea. So we talk a lot about that in the lab. So what does that mean? We're really looking for, um, we wanna earn equity in eight to 12 venture funded companies over the next one and a half, two years. Um, each having a billion dollar success case. So they probably aren't all gonna be billion dollar companies, but they need to have this business model that shows a growth that could be achievable towards a billion dollars. So if you think back to this, we're at the first stage of the first inning here, right? Like if we're in a baseball game, 
So this is really hard to do, because there's a lot of assumptions we have to make early on when we don't even sometimes have a working product yet to know that this might be that big of an idea. Um, we need to have at least 30% of winners, so this is kind of our internal metrics. Um, we're continually learning, developing talent, looking at what went right, what went wrong, and then really repeating. So we're just constantly in the cycle at the lab where we're spinning through ideas, spinning through um, what could make them work, business models, um, just, just really iterating all the time. So there's really f um, four parameters that determine our returns, selection, volume, percent ownership, and value add. And we're, we, we've kind of asked ourselves this question over the last year is where, as a lab, is our unfair advantage? Where can we really provide a lot of value to founders and to ourselves? And what we've really figured out is that's, and this might be a little bit hard to read, but that's selection. So we believe we can be the best in class at selection and that we can have an outside, outside, outside advantage at selecting the best ideas and the best talent to run those ideas. So that's what we're, we're really focused on. We're probably not gonna win on volume Percent ownership, actually, we, we wouldn't want to win on that because we want to be competitive with everyone else in the market. And we want to create uh, an environment where it's really, it's really uh, attractive to the founders. So a lot, some accelerator companies will take quite a bit of ownership, and we, um, we, want, we really want that to be fair for the founders that we're working with, even if we've developed the idea all the way to traction and before we bring someone in. Um, so here's kind of then what we're looking at. We're looking at this right tail lens when we look at the business model. And you've all seen these, these graphs, right, where you need something to go straight up, which almost looks a little impossible. But we need that there to be a case for that to even be possible, um, you know, whether it happens that fast or not, but just that it's possible. So um, the typical VC investing list is total addressable market. I don't know if you can all read this. Value prop product market fit, go to market, competitive moats, team, risks. These are some of, the th some of the things that typical VCs are looking at when they evaluate your idea. And then here's what we're looking at for right tail focus. So total potential market size, unlocking latent demand. So there's something there, maybe the world's changing in a way where we can really unlock something that's about to happen and we can kind of see that in the future. Um, industry vulnerability, so an alignment, a pain point, again, back to latent demand. Um, discontinuous disruptive opportunity, so uh, an innovation in a business model, in technology, in distribution. There's different ways you can innovate, um, and we look at those as well. And then rewards to success. What prize and additional opportunities does the success unlock that might be additional revenue streams? So those are kind of the, the ways we're looking at not just the standard VC, what they look at, but how can we look at something a little bit more unique and a little bit different? And I'll kind of tie that into the, to what I'll cover next here. Um, so here's some examples. And I can send this um, slide deck out to you all if you want to tweet me so you can see some of this. I've got actually some more detail in here that I can send. Um, but the five big transformations. So it's, it fundamentally disrupts an industry, like Expedia, Amazon, Salesforce. Those are some examples. It creates a brand new market, like Google, Airbnb, Facebook. Um, Arguably, gla argu arguably Glassdoor or Nextdoor. Um, it transforms or massively expands an existing market. So WeWork, Salesforce, um, Amazon's in that category as well, Robinhood. Uh, business model innovation, so an all new or many times improved price to value, performance, or customer alignment. Um, Robinhood's there as well. Airbnb, Kayak is some examples of that one. And then these network effects, so systematic or asymmetrical symmetrical network effects. So um, Facebook, LinkedIn, Amazon, YouTube, DocuSign, sort of like it creates additional people who will refer the business and it just kind of moves on from there. So those are some of the ways we're looking at this right tail um, opportunity that we have in front of us at the startup lab. And I think it might be interesting for some of you to think about that, those of you who are working on a startup for what you're working on as well. Um, Either can the idea be slightly changed to look through these lenses, um, or are you already working on some of these lenses? Because these are really attractive to VCs. And actually, if you even forget VCs, it should be really attractive to you too, because these are the type of opportunities that you really can start to see behind just the idea or the obvious idea to something else that somebody else might not see. It sounds like I'm nervous, but I'm having a hard time catching my breath because I'm pregnant. 
so. <laughs> I'm not nervous. I'm actually really excited to be here. <coughs> so um, focus area selection. So again, huge market opportunity. We're looking for the lab at the startup, eco at the Seattle ecosystem. And then we look at what our capability is at the lab. So there's some things that we just can't really do at the lab because they're probably going to take too long or we even don't have the expertise. For a little while, we were looking at voice, and I'll, um, I'll be sharing a little bit about a voice idea that we were looking at in a minute um, that we developed. Um, we were also looking at drones and some different technologies, but a lot of those, and, and blockchain, and we're still following those to a certain degree, but those aren't in our core areas of focus right now. We just realized we either don't have the focus on them in the lab, or we don't have maybe even the, the capabilities to figure out, like, like we don't have a drone testing facility. We don't have like a partner who does that. So those are areas that we're, we're watching and if the right opportunity comes up, but they're not core to our strategy right now. <coughs> a lot of us actually have experience in AI and ML companies. So that's really what we're heavily focused on right now. So this is, these are, so all that said, what we did, and I'll just give you a really quick background. We looked at really, um, it's, it's hard to know where to focus in a lab. You could, you could kind of do anything. Like I said, um, we have voice, we've got blockchain ideas, right and left. There's a lot of blockchain ideas. Um, drones, there's, um, it's just, there's so many different areas that we could focus on. And we were really um, finding ourselves looking at all these different areas and having a difficult time building expertise in one or different areas. So, um, and this might be helpful to any of you who are thinking about working with the lab. So these are really our six focus areas that we've narrowed it down to. And the way that we did that was we looked at um, a bunch of different factors, but um, and one of my colleagues, Ben Elowitz, um, and um, another one of my colleagues, Colton, did this research, and it was really uh, great research. They looked at um, really every different sector and how much innovation is happening in every different sector. And then, how much VC funding has been given to each sector and how recent that VC funding is. So if there's been huge bets in a few different areas, just in the last few months, we consider that an area that's sort of popping or emerging that we want to start looking at a little deeper. Um, and then you can overlay that with just different trends in the market. So how is the world changing? Kind of overlaid with these areas um, that have just this hyper or massive growth or disruption right now. So there's a, there's a lot more to this research, um, about 20 slides worth that I didn't include here because I didn't have enough time. But um, we really, really narrowed it down to these six areas, insurance, construction tech, real estate, fintech, health and wellness, and retail. And so again, these are areas that have had some recent or really interesting VC funding. A lot of money has recently been going into these areas. They're changing in some way or another, and then there's trends in the market that relate to these different areas. So at the lab, that's what we're really focused on. Yeah, you wanna ask a question? Uh, in your insurance, uh, can you break it down to what kind of insurance? Health insurance, commercial insurance, liability insurance? Yeah, yeah, yeah. so uh, we're sort of looking at all of those, actually. We're really building our expertise on insurance in general, and. What's interesting is that none of us in the lab really came from an insurance background or insurance company, but if you think about it, we've got True Panion here in Seattle, which is pet insurance. I mean, we really have a lot of different areas that focus on insurance. So there's a few that we're looking at right now. Um, there's reinsurance, um, which is something that's really interesting. It kind of gets a little bit technical, and I won't go into it, but we can talk about it after if you want. Um, there is, there is, um, real estate insurance, so Jetty, Rhino, there's a lot being done in this sort of real estate, is anyone familiar with Jetty? So it's um, homeowner's insurance, and then they also offer default insurance if you don't pay your, um, your lease. Or your, um, so there's, there's, so it's, those are kind of the areas that we're looking in. We're not just broadly looking at creating the next, let's say, metro mile, um, but we're looking at sort of what are those other sort of niche, or niche areas of insurance, but we're not, we haven't really narrowed it down yet. And one of the ways we do that, I'll, I'll cover in a minute, but one of the ways that we start to come up with ideas is we have these ideation sessions or um, invention sessions every Friday at the lab. And we bring in experts. So if any of you have, um, or if anyone on the live stream, <laughs> I guess we're talking to a larger group, has expertise in a certain area, and especially one of these six areas, um, every Friday we'll focus on a different area and we'll bring experts in and we'll work together with them to talk about ideas. And one of the goals with this 
number one is for our own learning and our own way to come up with new ideas. We, we just did one on, on insurance, which is why there's this broad list of ideas, and there's probably four or five that we're now following up on. Um, but if, if, yeah, so if anyone is an expert in one of these areas, we, we would bring them in, and partially it's for us to learn, and partially it's for us to continue to get to know the community, and if there might be people that would be a good fit to work with the lab or work with one of our companies um, or work on an idea with us. So that's really um, kind of how we do it. So we just had one on insurance, and right now um, the, the focus is pretty broad, but we're looking, trying to look under the rocks and the nooks and crannies and the areas that um, are sort of two clicks into insurance. So it's insurance, but it's insurance for um, homeowners or people who you know wouldn't pay their, or tenants who, who you know, in this day and age are having a hard time potentially paying um, their lease on time. So those are the kind of areas that we're looking at. Um, but great question, yeah. Any other questions on the focus areas? Is anyone working on an idea in one of these focus areas? All right, two people, I love it. Three? Nice, okay. Um, we'll have to talk afterwards. Um, so then we look at really, is it an enormous market, which is one of the sort of prerequisites of the areas? Is there a pain point or an unmet need or a different way to serve that market? And then is there a vulnerability in that area? So can we change the value prop? Can we move risk from one person or one party to the other party? Can we completely change what risk looks like? Can, I, can, we, can we flip something upside down to the way it's been done before? So those are some of the questions that we're asking within each of these um, six areas that I just covered. Um, and then, and then we really ask, does this have the potential to be an extraordinary company? Um, and this is really where we get into, and these are some of the questions that we ask as we move towards ideas. So we'll have an ideation session. We'll have maybe five or six that we're working on after an ideation session. And then we'll apply some of these questions to it and then look at the business model. So then again, it has to be, we have to be able to come up with some assumptions to a business model that makes it look like it could be potentially a billion dollar idea. Um, and I, again, I can send this out. I know some of these are actually kind of hard to read unless you're probably in the front row. Uh, how we do it. So like I just mentioned, we have these ideation sessions or invention days. Um, sometimes they are an hour and a half. Sometimes they are a full day session where we actually break out and talk about ideas. And um, by the way, you don't have to be in a lab to do this. I've actually just done it with some friends before. And if you get together with people who um, are knowledgeable or who can think differently, if you have friends that just think differently, um, get them together and just grab some wine and, uh, or seltzer water or whatever you drink and, um, and have an ideation. It's actually really fun. And, and um, there used to be one that I, that I went to, and I won't go too much into this, but it was created um, with the previous White House. So we'd get together and talk about issues in the community. Um, and that's how code.org started. It was just a group of people getting together around a table, talking about what needs were in Seattle, what needs were in different areas, and the fact that kids um, weren't getting STEM, um, you know, weren't learning STEM in school. And so how could somebody supplement that and make that um, some kind of a business idea or a nonprofit idea? So I, I'm really into those, and I, I'm always looking to hang out with people who think crazy. Um, and then we look at, we do, so we do that, and then if, and if, an idea, if we come up with an idea that we think is interesting, we've got a couple insurance ideas that are, that are in the pipeline right now, we'll just develop a one-pager. So it's a hypothesis on what we think this idea could be or something that could be behind it. We haven't done much research yet. We've just done some light research. We probably look to make sure nobody else is doing the exact same thing, or if they are, if, if we're a little bit, if we can be a little bit different. And then we'll do customer research. So do all of you feel pretty confident about how you're vetting ideas that you've had before, or do you feel like that's a, an area that you need to improve? Does everybody feel like, I know how to vet an idea. I know how to validate it. Is anyone like an expert in it? No, okay, all right. Is anyone not an expert in it? Okay, okay, you guys are still awake. All right, that's good. Um, so we've got, and I can go into a little, a little lot more of this if you guys wanna talk more about this too, but we'll do customer research. So what we start with is SurveyMonkey, and that is not the end all be all, but we look at, oftentimes we'll just look at getting a quick sense through a survey of if something is interesting or not to a certain audience. You can do a lot of targeting on SurveyMonkey. Again, it's SurveyMonkey, so we just had this idea we were working on, um, that actually we're still working on in the lab that is an insurance real estate idea, and it was specifically for landlords. So for that one, we looked at SurveyMonkey, and there is a way that you can target just people who um, 
own homes, but I'm not sure how many of those people are actually on a daily basis taking surveys on SurveyMonkey. <laughs> so we, we didn't put a whole lot of stake into that, and we usually don't. It's just a really early metric for us on if it works or not. And there's a lot of cool hacks you can do with SurveyMonkey to kind of get the answer that you're hoping for, because you never want to ask the question in a way that it just makes it an easy yes. You actually want to figure out if they have that pain point, if you're solving a problem, and then you can kind of tee up the idea towards the end to see willingness to actually use your actual idea. Um, and if anybody wants to talk more about that, I'd be happy to. But we spend a lot of time on surveys. So one of the things I've found, aside from survey monkey, to be way more helpful, and this is almost just through trial and error, but um, for, th for this one and for another idea that we were working on, um, I found some, there's a, fa there's a Facebook group for everything, right? <laughs> <laughs> and is, every, is, is anyone not on Facebook in here? Yeah, oh wow. Oh, actually a lot of people are not on Facebook, okay. Well, if you wanna get an account, just to, just to do this part, if you, if you wanted to, you don't have to do the rest. But it's a great place to do customer research. So we were again doing this landlord, um, this, this insurance idea for landlords, and I found out that there's, there were like hundreds of different groups for, and they weren't, they don't call themselves landlords, they call themselves, um, property managers, property owners, like there's different terms. Um, and there's, there's a whole bunch of different groups. So I found those and that's where I actually got a little bit more valuable information. Um, was able to talk to people one-on-one -on -one and do some surveys in there. And generally if you tee it up like, hey, I, I'm an entrepreneur working on a brand new idea and I'd really love your feedback. People love to help, especially if it's really easy. It only takes a couple minutes. Um, every, everybody loves to be like their own like sort of acting VC, right, to a startup idea, even if you're not in the startup space. So we've gotten some good um, feedback. From, there's also all kinds of other really neat hacks. So for this one in particular, we also um, got this idea. What if we looked at, and this is just kind of just showing another hack to kind of get you thinking, but we, we thought, what if we looked at Zillow um, and looked at who had a place for rent right now and asked those people what they thought of our idea? So we, because um, their phone numbers are actually on there, and, um, and so we did that. We contacted 50 people and got four responses, which is actually pretty good. Um, had one-on-one -on -one conversations with, I think, all four, and got some really good insight from them. And, and if you think about our target market, like they are squarely in our target market. They are landlords. They've got a place for rent right now. They're, they have the problems that we're trying to solve. So if you can get creative and think about how can you reach your you know, not in a spammy or advertising -y way. Like we reached out as if like, we're working on this startup idea and we think that you might actually benefit from it. Can we talk to you for like two minutes on the phone? And um, so it didn't come across like some creepy person who got their phone number, text message, uh, <laughs> is, is trying to hunt them down. Um, but it works really well. Those hacks work really well. And there's a whole, if, there's a whole bunch of them. If you can just think about where your customers are, um, and then approach them in a way that's not uh, too creepy or strange, um, you can get a pretty good response. So um, then, we'll, then we'll go into, um, sometimes actually what we'll do, so we've also done the thing where you go to Starbucks and you just ask people at Starbucks. You kind of just, you know, go to, um, we were working on another idea that was in um, reusing kids' clothes. And so just going to like the Goodwill or going to different places to get scrappy about where the people are and if they'd be willing to talk. And um, that's kind of, that's a little bit more difficult because you're really putting yourself out there when you're standing outside of Starbucks or somewhere else. But I mean, this is really the type of stuff that you need to do to validate your idea and, and just get scrappy and, um, and, and, and as close to your customer as you can. So the other thing that we do, and maybe some of you in the room have done this too, is we'll sometimes put up a landing page and send buy ads and send traffic to the landing page to capture email addresses just to see if the idea is resonating enough for people to want to put their email address in. And now there's all kinds of ways you can do this really fast. So Squarespace and there's a bunch of different templates that are either free or low cost where you can do a website in like two minutes, just get your value prop up there. Maybe there's a subhead, um, some kind of email capture or maybe just it'll be more about learn more. Um, there's a different bunch of different ways you can do it, but that one works really well. If we think we know, if we think we have a really good idea of what the value prop actually is, then we'll generally move to that stage where we'll do a landing page. Um, and that does work really well. And again, the landing page is easy to share in Facebook groups and a bunch of other places too, to get people um, to be able to see what you're working on versus having to jump on the phone with them. Uh, and then we'll just start repeating, iterating, repeating, changing the product, continually repeating, pivoting, 
Um, and sometimes, uh, and often actually, um, the idea gets killed eventually. Um, so then if, if the idea continues, we'll find early traction. And traction can mean a lot of different things. It can mean, um, I think number one in my mind is it means when you find something that you think customers, based on your baseline, uh, we have baselines, um, based on baselines are responding better to than you thought they would or thought they might. And you feel like this has got, there's something here, there's a spark here that we think that we could, that could take off. Um, that's when we generally start spending more time on developing the product as it is. But until that point, I don't think you really have enough data to know that you should keep going down that road with that exact product idea. Like, you might think it's a great idea, just like we talked about having friends who have done this. You think it's a great idea, you think it's the best idea you've ever heard. But other people might not think that. In fact, they might not even understand what your idea is. <laughs> <laughs> which is actually another really good hack. After you talk to somebody about your idea, ask them to repeat it to you. If they can't repeat it to you, you need to go home and like figure out what you're, like how you're gonna do your quick elevator pitch again. Um, and by the way, that's really, really common. Like, don't feel bad about that, because I mean, anyone, even us in the lab, sometimes we'll be sharing something and somebody will go, I don't totally get what that idea <laughs> is. <laughs> um, so, that early traction can also mean that there's um, investor interest. And sometimes if there's investor interest, we'll just continue with the idea without, we won't really, we'll continue down the path of doing um, uh, customer research, but we'll start to quickly get, if there's investor interest, that's, that's a signal to us that we're onto something. And it's, it's investor interest from Madrona Venture Group or from other investors as well. Um, the other piece of traction is we maybe we found an EIR, someone to lead this idea that's got experience in this space that we think can take this idea further than we can. Because they, um, if it's insurance, maybe they've, they've worked in real estate insurance before and they've kind of um, innovated some way in that space and have a lot of experience that we don't have and they're going to take this idea and iterate it and make it even better than it is right now and really figure out what that customer pain point is or what that customer opportunity is and solve it. Um, yeah, and then if that doesn't happen earlier, like I said, we just bring in the founding team or EIR if we still feel like the idea is worth pursuing and um, start often start pitching it to investors, yeah. Yeah, exactly. So how much are you going to charge? So it's really figuring out, even if you have a good, there's, there's been ideas that we've had in the lab that have been really good ideas. We've had really great response from surveys, from customer data, from one-on-one -on -one interviews, some of the best ideas that we've had. We could not figure out a business model. We couldn't figure out how to make reven enough revenue from it that it would actually be a viable business. And that's heartbreaking because if you have, it's hard to find customer traction. If you have it and you have a strong signal, but you still have to kill the idea anyway, it's one of the hardest things that we've ever had to do. Um, there was one um, that was actually before my time at the lab, and it was um, in the sports, sort of online sports, um, sort of sports betting. It was like this idea of like you're watching a show or you're watching a sporting event, and you can kind of, it, it was in that, in that vein, and it, it um, it had better response from customers than I think almost any other idea we've had in the lab, but we couldn't figure out how to make money from that um, in a way that actually, th that customers were interested in paying for. So, um, so it's really looking at you know, revenue, expenses. Some of the ideas we've had in the lab are high operational ideas, which isn't a good fit for the lab because we, we really wanna work on ideas more that are like ML, AI focused, things that don't require heavy, heavy operations and a huge, infrastructure. Um, it's looking at CAC, so cost to acquire customers. If that's really high, sometimes that'll kill an idea. We might think it's a good idea, we might have great customer um, response, but gosh, to reach these customers, it's like $500, and we haven't found a better way to reach them, and they're just really hard to reach. Or there's some industries that just almost like aren't even open to, and insurance is kind of one of these, like if you're in a B2B, um, insurance space, it's hard to sell, sell into these small insurance companies or these small um, insurance people. Uh, they're just not looking for innovative, you know, it's, they're just not top of mind for them. So maybe it will be at some point, but it, there's, there's some areas that are just harder to get customers or harder to sell into, so um, cost to acquire customers. Um, and then we look at things like churn, like how long do we think we're gonna keep these customers? And a lot of these things are assumptions in the beginning, again, because we don't have enough experience to know how long we'll keep a customer. 
But there's a lot of industry data out there where you can start to piece together what this could be. And in this piece, you can really look at what, um, and, and sometimes it's difficult, but if you really can start digging in and talking to people, you can get to what, you can, you can start to learn what the um, competition or what people who are like, like doing similar in the industry, what their churn might look like or what their cost to acquire a customer might look like. Um, so again, a lot of those are assumptions, but they have to, it has to look good enough that you want to continue with the idea. And it's something that we've learned in the lab. We didn't spend enough time on the business models early on. We would just follow more of the customer, tra customer traction, customer excitement, and, figure, and kind of think that that will come. And to a certain degree, it could, and, it, and there's, many there's many times where it does. But there's also many times where you just have a great idea that maybe might end up being a lifestyle business or even just almost like a nonprofit almost. It's not going to make money, even though there's a lot of interest in it and people seem jazzed about it. They might not be willing to pay, or they might not be willing to pay enough, <laughs> or they just don't see it as a big enough pain point to want to pay. So great question. Any other questions on the business model piece? OK. Um, I got you all after you ate lunch, right? Is everybody ready for a nap here? Um, so I covered this a little bit, but this is kind of, we, we generally work on ideas for six to nine months. If it's more than that, it sort, of, it sort of starts to become out of the scope where we should be working on another idea. So that's the time where we want to bring an EIR in or we want to get it out of the lab because we've got to start working on another idea. So it starts with um, really month one, market validation, month two and three, product market fit, Month four and five, um, proof of traction. We might start recruiting the founder team if the idea is still going at that point. And then month six, um, funding, transition, and spinning it out of the lab. So that's kind of how the high level of how it works. Um, I think I talked about this, so I might skip this and go into, um, go into a little bit of some examples. How are we doing on time? Oh, 12, okay, so I'll go through these really quick and then we can move into Q&A. So I, I have two examples here and spoiler alert, both of, the idea, both of the ideas got killed. I'll just say that off the beginning so you're not uh, bummed out when, I, when the ending isn't great for both of them. But they're really cool ideas. We're actually still really excited about both, the, both of these ideas which is one of the reasons why I thought it'd be fun to talk about them. So the first one is called Hyper AI. So it's this idea of what if, um, we've all heard about people who have gotten sick or read the news about people who have gotten sick by eating something. What if um, you could say that that would never happen again? And the way that, the way that we were thinking about that was automated food um, analysis through hyperspectral imaging. So we, for this one, we actually brought hyperspectral cameras into our lab and we did a bunch of experiments with food just to see, um, and this was around the time, just recently, well, a few months ago, everybody was scared of eating lettuce for a little while, and you couldn't eat romaine lettuce, you couldn't find it, um, because it, it wasn't safe. So the timing actually ended up being kind of great for this one, uh, as we were talking through the idea. But really what we looked at is um, meat and foreign objects in meat, and you can actually see if there's bacteria or different things in there that, that shouldn't be in the meat. We also looked at um, apples. This, these are apples right here. And I think I have this. So here's, a, here's an apple that we bruised. I mean, this is just getting down to the very basics. We bruised an apple. You can't really see that it's bruised here, but you can see it in the hyperspectral imaging. And then after a few days, you can really see that it's bruised more. Um, so this could be, some, this, it could also have helped grocery stores figure out what produce is good and what's not good. Sometimes they'll get a whole shipment that's really not good, but it looks good in the moment, and then you get it in the store and it's not. Um, so there's a lot of different uses for this one. The biggest one we thought was really kind of eliminating the worry that you'd ever get sick or die from eating something anywhere because you could see if there was anything foreign or anything that would hurt you. Um, so that was a really fun one. 128,000 people are hospitalized and 3,000 die. This is 2017 data from foodborne illnesses. Um, this was a really fun one to work on because we really felt like it was a real problem. And if you could, wouldn't everyone want to have something like this, either on your phone or maybe a different way um, to be able to see it? It got killed, as I told you in the spoiler alert. Um, we couldn't, there's not really a way that we could figure out to put it in the phone yet to make that part of your everyday phone. And then we really couldn't figure out um, a perfect use case for who would be the one to buy it and that we could get enough traction in six to nine months to, 
be able to bring people in, or even just in a few months, we could get enough um, big customers um, from either the grocery or supply chain side. Um, you know, the, the, the people who are selling this produce, it's not really in their best interest to want to see if, it's, if there's anything wrong with it. Um, so we really had a hard time kind of figuring out the business model side, where it would fit in, and how we'd actually really make money with it, given that we couldn't put it in all of consumers' hands yet. So um, we still love this idea, and it was kind of heartbreaking. It's, oh, it's so hard to kill an idea in the lab, because um, you get really attached to them, and you're working on them, and you see the potential, and you see the way it could change the world. So the next one I'll share before we go into Q&A is called Speak Feedback. And these slides are different, because I just pulled from some of our team slides working on it. Um, this is one that the idea, how many people have a voice, some kind of voice product in your home right now? Oh, wow. More people than have Facebook in here, I think, <laughs> have a voice product. Okay, I like this group. Um, so this is the idea that what if you could effortle effortlessly give feedback on a product idea through Google or through Alexa um, and just give feedback on what you liked or didn't like about it. And even if you maybe wanted to return it, because you just really didn't like it, you could just do that via voice instead of having to fill out the survey, get five reminders about the survey via email. We could just make it more of a conversational thing. Did you like it? Yeah, I love the shoes. What did you like about the shoes? They fit really well and they're comfortable. So you kind of go back and forth. Um, we had this really neat product demo. Um, Hannah on our team built, actually built the product and did a product demo for it. Um, and this was neat because there's these, um, some startups have this idea of a shadow market. So Rover was like this. They talk about a shadow market where people weren't using what, uh, they weren't using Rover before. They were probably using friends and family or going to PetSmart or one of those pet companies to leave your pets. But now you could leave it with somebody five houses down because they're, um, so it kind of opened up this market of people who they didn't know how big their market was until they started launching the product and innovating in that space. And this is one where we thought we kind of had that too. A lot of people don't do reviews, right? It's just a hassle, why would you do it unless you want to return the product or you really feel strongly about it. You either love it or you hate it. There's not a lot of like three star reviews. People are just aren't doing them just for fun in the middle. Like it was okay. Uh, so we thought that th there was some um, potential with that market size. Um, and we developed a prototype, a working prototype. We um, pitched it with, within big um, groups. We have, we have an event called Open Pitch and if any of you want to come, here are some of the ideas that we're working on. We do it every three months or so, where we showcase all the ideas in the lab to the community. So um, everybody here is welcome to, to come join us for that. Um, so we did it. We had this working prototype. It was really neat. Um, but in the end, we couldn't figure out. And we even had actually pro um, trialed this with a customer. But we really couldn't figure out how to get customers fast enough, how to get enough revenue. So again, this one kind of came down to really business model. We f still think this is a great idea, but we couldn't figure out a business model to make this one work. And we worked on it for several months, and in the end it was just like, there's better ideas that we have on our pipeline, so we need to keep moving on. So um, that one was a heartbreaker too, because it was a really fun product, and it actually, it's, fu it's fun to like talk back to something in a, in a conversational way, and have it be a useful conversation that, that, that is then passed on to the brand, so. Uh, I will move to Q&A, because I've been talking a lot. Yeah. Uh, so I have a question about validation. Uh, in your process, oh, thank you. I have a question about validation. In your process, uh, when do you move from validation without a minimum viable product to validation with one? Like at what point? And what is the difference in feedback uh, or metrics you get uh, with both of those? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I would say um, we always have a minimum viable product unless there's investor interest early on and we want to fast track that idea for some reason. Um, and we haven't had very many of these, but I just recently had a chance to talk to Spencer who now is no longer going to be the CEO of um, Zillow. But so that was one where, where they knew they had something really special and they actually, like it's one of those rare cases where you don't share it yet because you want to just launch it. Like you don't want to get a bunch, in fact, a lot of his employees didn't even know from the very beginning exactly what the product was when they joined. But that's so, I mean, usually, like, people think that's, and I think the, the thing with entrepreneurs, sometimes we think that's the norm. Like, oh, we have to protect our idea and hide it, and, and we can't share it with anyone. You know, a lot of times people come to Startup Weekend and want to, like, not share their, they, they came to work on a startup in their startup, but they didn't want to share it during open pitch because 
somebody else might take it. And really it's all, I mean, it's really all execution. Like probably nobody's gonna feel as passionate about that idea and do a better job than you are. I've hardly ever seen that happen. Um, but I would say the MVP and then getting, getting some kind of traction on that MVP that people are willing, so you know people are willing to pay for that exact product the way that you have it. Um, is, is where we like to be for pretty much every idea. I, can, I can't really think of a great example where we haven't, haven't done that. Um, the most recent spin out that we had is this company that aggregates data from different sources, GitHub, um, Slack, different sources to kind of help a manager know if they're doing a good job or not um, and to help an employee kind of know if they're gonna doing a good job as well. And that one, um, yeah, that one we even had a couple, and, and a lot of times it's beta. So we'll have an MVP and we'll have beta customers working on it. And that's usually the stage where we're at where we'll start to spin it out of the lab and look for funding. Yeah, does that answer your question? Yeah, I think you said you had a drone in the office. Like because that's a physical product, would you guys not be able to have MVP or beta or have those gathered to the ground? Yeah. Put it in people's hands? So, we, so that's a great example of something that we really moved away from being a major focus of ours. It's not one of our six right now because um, it's just a little bit hard. Our lab is a lab form. It's not like a, we don't have um, like a, a Blue Origin type setup where we've got like physical cool things happening. And um, well, we do, but not in that way. Um, so we've so that one was a tougher one for us, and we really did move away as much from focusing on drones. Although we're still kind of watching the space, but um, but that's that's probably a good example of one where if we had pursued it, we'd have to rely on outside experts, and we'd have to probably rely on. And that would actually probably for us be more of an accelerator company versus one we created from scratch because we just don't have the drone um, demo area yeah. or <laughs> I guess we could do it in downtown Seattle. <laughs> yeah, good question. Anyone else? Yeah. Hey, uh, what are the metrics that you use to define whether or not you continue pursuing the idea versus killing it? So like what are the actual metrics? Something specific yeah. like landing page, like emails? How many emails are you looking yeah. to get off of that? Or what are the other metrics that you guys actually use? That's, uh, th I love that question. And it's something that we, just to be very honest about, we're still figuring out. It's a little bit fuzzy because every idea is different. And that's what we struggle with. We really struggle with that. We create these baselines and we do have some. Um, and you can generally like get a gut sense of like, wow, this is really catching on, or like it's crickets, kind of crick, you know, it's kind of like we're not getting much of a response. But we do, we do have benchmarks and baselines, and I can follow up with some of those. I actually have some of them in the slides that I um, went through pretty fast on SurveyMonkey and some of the surveys, um, or some of the slides that I actually didn't cover. Um, but we are we're still looking at that because every idea is different. So if it's B to B, we get a, we get a different type of response than if it's B to C. The industry is different, and oftentimes we'll keep pivoting the idea. Um, so I, yeah, I can follow up with some of those specifics, um, and then and then it's sort of like there's also the question of how many people do you need to ask or check with before you sort of feel like you have a statistically relevant sample size. And we've just recently gotten some outside help um, to come and look at our current models. So we're actually just kind of redoing this um, for our surveys. So, so we've kind of figured out great places to share the surveys, but we had been do, we've been trying to do them as fast as we can, and we kind of realized we're not asking enough people. And so we had this great um, contact that we met that sort of an, is an expert in surveys and data and in this particular area, and she was recommending that it's like 300 to 500 that we get via surveys, and a lot of those we can we can do part of them paid on SurveyMonkey and part of them sort of through like people we know, which we don't want to do too many of that because a lot of times you get a, a better response. But then also these Facebook groups and other ways, whether it's like like I shared the Zillow data, or other ways you can, can kind of supplement that so you can get up to um, more than, sometimes we were just doing like 100 and we we're kind of like getting a great response or not a great response and we felt like that was represent representative. And uh, so we're just kind of tweaking that right now and continue to learn about it. But I think the at the highest level, it's so hard because every day idea is different and the type of response you get from ideas, the, like the baselines are almost different. What we're trying to do now is look at by industry and start to build some baselines within the industries and within um, the sectors, whether it's B2B or B2C. So, so that's where the focus areas really help the lab. I mean, you're all working on, all of you who are working on an idea, you don't have that because you're just focused on your idea. Um, but yeah, I'd be happy to, to share specifics on that. Yeah, I'll share the slides out afterwards. Yeah. 
And we probably have time for one more question. Okay. Oh, now everybody has a question. <laughs> <laughs> I was like. <laughs> and you can also chat with Shauna after as well, if yeah, you're sticking around, around for, a bit, for a little yeah. bit. Hi, Shauna. You, you have a number of, of filters that bring ideas to you, and, and I understand that you want to home grow those ideas. But is there a mechanism in your organization to, to take ideas that's, that <clears throat> somebody in this room might have and, and, and bring them in? Uh, or do you not like that model? Yeah, I love that model. <laughs> I like the word homegrown too. Um, so really there's two ways that works. Um, we meet with entrepreneurs all the time who want to meet about ideas and just talk about them. And, um, and we're open to like thinking about different ways of doing that with, with the lab support. Um, what we look for though is, and, and, the, and the second one I'll say is our accelerator program. So with our accelerator program, it's a three month program um, you get hands-on help from our team. Um, we set up meetings with Moderna Venture Group. Um, so you kind of have access to our network. You're in our space. You're with us. Um, but I would, say, I would say two things are really important to that. Number one, we look at the team. So we want to we work with people who are interested in pivoting or interested in being agile and, and, and maybe not thinking that their idea, unless they have traction already, is the perfect idea, right? Like, so you have to, we're kind of looking at like, are you one of those dynamic founders that we want to work with? Um, and and are, you, are you willing to be? So sometimes it kind of just, you know, we'll work with you a little bit. And the second one is, do you have some traction already? So we're looking for something that already has some traction so we can help expedite that and then have this sort of institutional round of funding at the end of the accelerator. So we want, we want to help teams meet milestones. We want to help you get, we want to help you um, to the point where you can get the funding, but we want you to start with us with some, generally with some level of traction if it's for the accelerator. Um, if it's not, if we're just having a conversation about potentially working together in some way, um, then, then we might be open to different ideas, but um, we'll want to see why you think that that's a huge idea. Yeah. Great question. Does that answer your question? I think so. Okay. So you, you don't leave those ideas out? No. You're, you're not just homegrown? No. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And there's different models and you know even Madrona Venture Group sometimes has EIRs in working on different ideas, you know, from a pretty early start. In fact, um, Mavron had um, Zulily in. They incubated Zulily and the, the team working on Zulily. They weren't part of an accelerator. They just went in and had an idea. Sometimes what helps is if you've had a successful startup in the past to be able to walk in and be like, I have another idea. <laughs> and they're like, okay, you've done it before. Let's get you in here. Um, otherwise, it takes a little bit more sort of some kind of proof point to go, I'm on to something that I believe in. there is something here. And this is why you should, you should want to work with me. Yeah. Yeah, that part's tough. You've got to sell yourself, right? And it's not always easy for all of us. Yeah. Okay, um, I do want to respect people's time uh, since it is one, but if you do have any questions, please stick around. Thank you for coming and thank you for a great presentation. Yeah, thank you.